Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. First of all, uh, a little bit of an introduction is probably in order. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Jimmy Painter. Um, I, I'm currently a chaplain uh, both at Howard and at, down in Ukiah. Uh, I was a, a youth pastor in Ukiah for about six years, and then I was uh, uh, the, the pastor, district pastor for Hillsburg and Cloverdale churches. Uh, and I've been doing chaplaincy work now here uh, for about a year and a half. And uh, so, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure to spend this, this Sabbath with you. Uh, w one of the reasons why I'm, I'm happy to be here today is because, uh, I, as, as I mentioned before, I've been a pastor for a number of years, and and now currently I'm a chaplain, and it has been a transition for me. It has been something that I have uh, grown and expanded, and my understanding of of how to be with people has definitely changed. Um, and so today, one of the things that I would like to share with you, as one of the as one of the lessons that I have learned most recently in the last year and a half, has to do with the power of presence. For those of you who don't know, a chaplain sometimes ends up dealing with the, uh, an individual who is in the deepest and darkest, most difficult times of their, of their life. It's an honor to be there, but also it's a scary place, scary place sometimes if you're relying on yourself. Today, I would like to point you towards a few things, but in order to do that, I'd like us to take a moment to pray. Will you bow your heads with me? Father God, I thank you so much for the gift that you give us for the work that you provide for us, for the chance that you've given to us to be co-laborers with you, with your gospel. Lord, it is, a, it is an honor to be in your presence. It is an honor to be here in a way that helps people. Father, I pray that you will be with every single one of us here today. I pray that you will be with the words that come out of my mouth, I pray that you will help every single one of us to have an encounter with you here today that is something powerful, that is something meaningful. I pray, Father, for your presence here today. In your name I pray, amen. For starters, I need to give you a little bit of background information. You probably have already read the, the, stricture, the scripture reading for today. But that doesn't quite cover what's happening. And so first I need to paint a picture. This is a very, very tumultuous time in Israel's life. We have gone well beyond the time of David and Solomon. This is a time in, the, in Israel's history where there is quite literally civil war. And in this, in this period of time, the, the ten kingdoms, or sorry, the ten tribes have already split off from the, from the original 12. Judah and Benjamin have stayed together, and all the other 10 have separated, They're called the northern kingdoms. And in this particular time in history, there's, there's a problem, and that is the northern kingdom of Israel is wanting to invade and take over the southern kingdom of Judah. Civil war. And, in, and to make matters worse, it's not just the fact that they are intending to invade and wipe out, arguably, their brothers. But what, what is also important is that they are gathering the forces of other neighboring nations in order to, in, in order to bolster their material, the, their, their, their soldier, their army, in order to make sure that this, this war is easy and quick. But the problem is, is that there is a lot of, there's a lot of mistrust going on. And King Ahaz at this time 
he looks around and he sees everything that all the forces that are arrayed against him and he is in, and he's dealing with the fear of the possibility that his nation is about to be invaded rightly so he is quaking in his boots he cannot stand against the forces of everything that is arrayed against him it is impossible he looks at all the soldiers, he looks at all the equipment, he looks at all the nations, he looks at the sheer geographical circumstances of strategically and tactically, it is impossible for him to stand against everything that is about to come against him. And he's scared. He's rightly scared. And I would like you to, you to pause for a moment to let that fear sink in. Have you ever been in a place, been in, 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 in a moment in time when you have found yourself completely overwhelmed and incapable of dealing with everything that you feel is coming against you? Let that moment sink in with you for a second. Touch that fear. Because when we look at this story, we must recognize how desperate Ahaz is feeling. We look, at a, we look at this story most of the time and we think how wonderful that it is that we have this prophecy that this virgin birth is about to take place. We think about the, we think about the Christmas songs. We think about the tree. We think about this cute manger scene that takes place. But why was this prophecy given in the first place? It was given so that humanity would know that they're not alone. It was given so that men and women would know that they are not alone. I want to read to you the passage that leads up to it. In Isaiah chapter 7, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up. Isaiah chapter 7, I'm going to be, the, the scripture reading is in verse 14, but we're going to be looking at verse 10 for starters. It says this, then the Lord again spoke, uh, uh, then, the Lord, then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it, make it deep as Sheol, or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. We need to pause there for a moment. Did you hear what's happening? God is saying, ask for a sign, not just any sign. Ask for as low or as high as you want, and I will give it to you. Have you ever been given a blank check from a God? Think about how, what that might have meant. Have you ever been given a blank check from God? You say it, and I'll do it. God offers this to Ahaz. This remarkably precious gift. Something that I dare say any one of us in this room would love to experience. What sign would you ask for? What sign would you ask for to say, I know, if, I, if this happened in my life, would I know for sure that God is with me? Let that, let that moment resonate with you for a second. Because when we, when we experience this story, we have to understand that God is laying out this open gift to Ahaz. Yeah, and he botches it. Ahaz totally fumbles the ball. Ahaz is given the opportunity to ask for anything that God is willing to give him. Anything that he can imagine. And God, and, and God says, oh, sorry, God says, anything you want. And Ahaz says, I will not ask. Because he thinks he's putting God to the test. 
He's not putting God to the test. God offered. He offered. He said, ask. He's begging him to ask. God is in the moment of is in the is in the uh, uh, in the mode of trying to ex- instill comfort and security. He's trying to express his desire to say, "I am with you in every single sense of the word." And God gives this opportunity to Ahaz, and Ahaz dismisses it as if to say, "No, I would be presumptuous." Friends, God makes you promises if you would ask for them. God gives him a blank check and he says, No, I don't want I don't want it. I won't ask for anything. And in thirteen he says, Then he said, Listen now, O house of David, is it too is it uh, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of man, but now you will try the patience of God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, A virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the the time he knows enough to refuse evil and to choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose kings you you dread will be forsaken. He says, by the, before this child is weaned, everything that you fear it may happen, those kingdoms will be forsaken. They will be gone. It will be but a memory. I am challenged by this passage for a number of reasons. One of the reasons why I'm challenged by this passage is because when I think about, when I think about, when I put myself in Ahaz's position and and God says what do you want what kind of sign would you like to have so and so comes back from the dead so and uh, uh, you you see all of a sudden all the all in California you know we've been dealing with the drought for so long thankfully not anymore but all of a sudden if uh, if 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 I prayed during during those times of drought would if we had lakes that were all of a sudden filled with water would that be enough to convince me that God was with me what would be your ask? What would be your ask if, if God came to you and said, what do you desire to know for sure that I am at your side? The thing that I've learned so, so passionately and so fiercely throughout all of this time is that it was not a mistake that God chose the name Emmanuel as his as his as his prophecy God with us now it is important for me to pay attention to this because when I think about all of the ways in which someone is with us that could mean a lot and most of the time when I think about this, especially as a pastor, most of my thinking has to do with you know, being up front, being, being, uh, being in the pulpit and preaching a sermon, relaying information, teaching, speaking what I know, sharing my thoughts. And that, was, and that, and that has its place. It is, it is a leadership position. But what I've also learned, especially in my time in being a chaplain, is that... If God is with us, he doesn't necessarily have to speak. If God is with us, he doesn't necessarily have to teach. If God is with us, he doesn't necessarily have to save. He is just with us. We are already safe. See, what I've learned about all of this is that the presence of God creates a moment in time that is completely unique. 
presence of God creates a moment in time where that allows us to look at this experience that we, that we go through in such a way that it teaches us that, w- that words are not important. Who we are in the moment is important. And when we find ourselves in the in the place where we are present in the where we are present in the midst of God, there is something amazing, mysterious, powerful, supernatural, miraculous that takes place when we find ourselves in the presence of God. If you don't believe me, ask Moses when he encountered the burning bush. He was present with God. If you don't believe me, we can take a look at which story do you want to pick. Pick a story from the Bible. Shadrach, Meshach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't really experience a lot of heat in that furnace, did they? We could pick the time, we could, we could pick the time when, when there was a battle taking place and all they needed was a few more hours so they, they could continue winning the battle. And God's presence stopped the sun in its tracks. You cannot tell me that God's presence does not have power. Where else? Pick a time. Pick a time in the Bible where God's presence made the difference. You want to talk about a time when there was all of a sudden an axe head that floated in the water? Do you want to talk about a time when there was a pillar of smoke and fire and God's presence was there? Do you want to talk about a time when there was a moment when when Jesus looked at at an individual, didn't say a thing, and he was healed? Pick a time in 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 all of biblical history where God's presence showed up, and I can tell you something miraculous happened. Didn't have to be used with words. Didn't have to be expressed with some powerful, magical supernatural supernatural uh, uh, conveyance of words. It was just God himself that was there. We experience God not through just his teaching, but by his character himself. We experience God when by who he is, we are changed. Not by the words that he uses not by how he interacts with us. It is by just God himself and the power of how he presents himself to us. My friends, I'm looking at all of the mysteries of, of the Bible. I look at it and I, and I find myself amazed. <clears throat> I look at my, <clears throat> excuse me, I look at myself and I find myself amazed at the fact that God through Jesus, sent a representative of showing that this is how I will display my personhood. I will send my son, God, with us. It was Jesus on the cross that displayed the character of God. He didn't have to use words. He just died for our sins. And by now, by now we look at this open opportunity. Jesus dying on a cross. Now we have this opportunity where that veil was torn apart. And now there is no barrier between man and and God. Again, God's presence makes the difference. And so I challenge you, all of you today, when I look at this when I look at this, this moment, some of us are often challenged when we want to be present, when we want to help someone, when we want to, to be God's hands and feet. Most of the time we think we have to say something. Most of the time we think we have to do something. But I would like to challenge you today and, and, and perhaps think about things a little bit differently. Instead of asking yourself, what can I do? What can I say? Maybe ask yourself, who do I need to be for this person? How can I be a blessing to them by just being present with them? 
Because when in the midst of our fear, in the midst of our darkness, in the, midst, in the midst of our valleys, of our chaos, of our pain, of our heart, of our hurt, in the midst of all of that, it may not necessarily be words that, that give us comfort. It may be that gentle hand that is continuing to hold ours. There's a story that was given to me. It's not my story. But it was inspiring to me because I knew him. Um, when I was in high school, I had a choir teacher. And a uh, fantastic guy. Beautiful soul. He and I got close. And um, eventually he told me that he had been in Vietnam. I'd like to share with you his story. He was a young Adventist boy, and he had decided, and he, I don't know if he had been drafted or not, but he, he found himself in Vietnam as a medic. He was a non-combatant, and he was attached to a light armored division. And in the process of him Serving his tour, one day he was making his way through the jungles of Vietnam and he was in the in part of the convoy that was moving through and they were ambushed. Bullets start flying everywhere and all of a sudden the call comes over the radio, send the medic, someone's hit. He jumps out of the armored vehicle and he starts running towards one person that was, that was wounded. Administers aid to him, gets him stabilized. And not as, as soon as he was done, he receives another call. Another, another man down, send the medic. By this time, the bullets are flying. And soldiers, their barrels are so hot that they're worried that the, that the rounds might cook off in the barrel even if they don't pull the trigger. That's how fierce the fighting is by this time. And so what they have to do in order to, keep, in, in order to, in order to keep their medic safe, there's nowhere else to run. The soldiers are backed up against something that, that, that he can't get behind them. He's got to run in front of them. So instead of him, to, him having to run behind them where it's safe, he has to get up on top of the berm and run in front of not just the enemy, but also his own soldiers. And so he's running across this berm back and forth, administering combat care to one wounded man after another. In fact, they have to point their barrels up just in case the, 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 the round, just in case the barrel is so hot that it cooks off around. So as he's coming by, they're firing and they're firing. As he's coming by, they lift up the barrel and then he go, they go back to firing. I don't know how long he does this. But in the midst of all of that time, in the midst of that entire combat, he managed to, to save every single man but one. I'm challenged by that story because of what he told me right as he was leaving that armored car, armored vehicle. He put very simply, he said this, God, it's you and me. And he grabbed his back, he grabbed his backpack and ran out. If you doubt the power of God's presence then you haven't been paying attention, if you doubt that God cannot change the heart of an individual. If you doubt that God's presence doesn't allow you to do miraculous things, if you doubt that God in his magnificent presence doesn't offer blessings from heaven that allow you to ha experience powers beyond this world can possibly imagine, that I'm sorry, but this Bible needs to become alive to you. 
I pray that you will experience a power and a connection of realizing that God in his presence offers you the power of the universe. The mystery and beauty of this prophecy is that God is saying, I am with you. In your fear, in your darkness, in the times when you are terrified, in the times when you are scared beyond belief and you cannot make sense of the world around you, I am with you. He will not remove the danger, but he will be with you through it. Please, please let yourself be challenged by God's presence on a daily basis. If you, if you struggle recognizing that God is, is powerful enough to change your circumstances, go back to him. My experience in my life has been changed because I have understood, I have got to a deeper understanding of what God's presence means. The power of just being present with an individual. You can offer that same kind of presence to the people who are hurting near you. doesn't have to be with words. It doesn't have to be with grand philosophies. Someone who is hurting does not need to understand your state of the dead philosophies. Someone who is in pain does not need to know about God's perfect plan. They need to know you. They need to know that you are there for them, that you are strong enough to hold them in that moment. I pray that you will witness that kind of power as you go through your Christian journey. I pray that you will witness that kind of beauty as you seek to, to comfort people who are close to you. His presence is stronger than you can imagine. And I, and I challenge you to rely on it. I invite you to pray with me. Father God, I thank you so much that you are with us. Please bless, the, bless everyone, every single person here today. And what they need most is your presence. Lord, I ask for your wisdom, for your guidance, for the blessing of this Sabbath day. And let us spend some time with you today. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.